Dr. Rim Feriani is the educational director at the Ibn Arabi Society. She has lectured in Arabic language at King's College London and taught Arabic language and cultural studies at the University of Westminster, also here in London. Today, she will examine the concept of the Barzakh, often translated as Isthmus, in the teachings of Ibn Arabi and its interrelationship with imagination. She will also discuss the ways in which the works of contemporary writers, such as the renowned Moroccan author, Tahar Ben Jaloun, and the acclaimed Algerian author, Asya Jabbar, are infused with mystical images that recall the imaginative world of Ibn Arabi. Thank you, David. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for the beautiful introduction as well and for this uh, collaborative work that uh, we started working on it last year. And I, I would say, luckily, we, we had the lockdown because now with Zoom, we had the opportunity to meet more people from all over the world. Um, and of course, the opportunity of working with uh, several universities, such as King's College, Westminster University, the Open University and Queen Mary. So thank you for this uh, collaboration. Um, in today's presentation, I will explain the uh, concept of the Baza, often translated as Isthmus, in the teachings of Ibn Arabi and its interrelationship with imagination. Furthermore, I will also discuss how the works of contemporary writers, such as uh, the internationally renowned author Taha bin Jaloun and the acclaimed Algerian author Asya Jabbar, are infused with Sufi mystical images that recall the imaginative world of Ibn Arabi. And for that, I will share, first of all, my screen uh, to have some visuals to help me uh, along this presentation. So if you can bear with me a moment. So um, firstly, I think at, at just to start with, it's important that I refer to the um, references made in the Quran to the Barzakh itself. Um, this will help clarify how Ibn Arabi took his inspiration from the Quranic book of Revelation. The close tie between Ibn Arabi's teachings and the Quran have been highlighted by the 21st century French scholar, Michel Chotkewix, in his book, uh, An Océan Sans Rivage. Uh, Shotkiewicz observes that Ibn Arabi affirms that everything of which he speaks in his writings comes from the Quran. In fact, any reader of Ibn Arabi notices an abundance of scriptural references page after page. And in a very similar vein, Todd Lawson in his uh, talk on the ecology of imagination, uh, he talks about this relation between the works of Ibn Arabi and the Quran in terms of an umbilical connection. So um, what you see in front of you, it's a, a visual image of what is known as the meeting of the two seas. And this is mentioned uh, in the Quran. So the following verses are taken from the Quran where they directly refer to this concept of the Barzakh. And the first verse that I'm reading, it says, and it is he who merged the two seas, this one fresh and sweet and that one salty and bitter and he placed between them a barrier and an impassable boundary. Then in the next verse, it says, till when death comes to one of them, he says, my Lord return me happily, I shall do righteousness in that I forsook. Nay, it is but a word he speaks, and there behind them is a barrier, barzakh, until the day that they shall be raised up. This is the end of the second verse. So in relation to these two particular verses that I just cited, uh, Tomayo Tesei in Islamic History and Civilization notes the following. These verses form the locus classicus for the question of the intermediate state in the Quran. The Mufassirun, or what is known as the commentators, ex expended considerable energy speculating on the meaning of these two verses. The term Barzakh mentioned is the crux for the commentators who explain it either as the space between the worlds of li the living and the dead, or as the time between death and resurrection. So the Quranic text suggests that the Barzakh means a physical obstacle that confines the dead to an unspecified place, place sorry, until the time of their resurrection. Western scholars have in consequence understood the Barzakh as a barrier that prevents the deceased from returning to the world of the living. 
The interpretation of the barzakh as a barrier is strengthened by the two other occurrences of the word in the Quran, where the barzakh is said to separate two cosmic seas of sweet and salt waters. Therefore, it seems that the Quran attributes to the barzakh the twofold function of cosmological and eschatological partition. Now, in the canonical tradition, the notion of the intermediate state between death and the final judgment, which is called barzakh, is linked essentially with the grave. Um, and I take here the example of Al Ghazali, who, in the revival of religious sciences, devotes few chapters where he talks about the transitory nature of the tomb and how it symbolizes the isthmus between life and afterlife. So in the sense the common usage of the concept of the barzakh as a barrier has influenced early scholarship on the meaning of this particular concept. Maliha Karbasin in the meaning and etymology of barzakh in illuminationist philosophy, illuminationist philosophy notes that in Arabic lexicons, barzakh is defined as barrier, a barrier between two things, a barrier between paradise and hell, the grave, and as well as a wall. So though Barzakh appears in the Quran, some consider it to be a non-Arabic or rather a Persian term. Now, the question is how then does Ibn Arabi understand the Barzakh and how does he use it in relation to imagination, which is the main theme of our uh, uh, event today? Um, what I would like to emphasize before I talk a bit more about the use of Barzakh in Ibn Arabi's work is that Ibn Arabi made a huge and significant contribution to the understanding of this beautiful concept. Now, the concept of the Barzakh and its interrelationship with imagination is a running theme throughout Ibn Arabi's works. For example, uh, I take one of his works, which is called The Secrets of Voyaging. Ibn Arabi links the voyage of Noah and the Ark of Salvation to the knowledge of the Barzakh where opposites such as fire and water meet and are then transformed. Chapters 63 and chapter 8 of Ibn Arabi's opus magnum, The Meccan Openings, reinforce the interdependence between the Bazaar and imagination. Ibn Arabi describes imagination as a liminal space using the adjectival form barzakhi, and therefore it cannot be characterized either by being nor non-being. And here I'm using the words of Salman Bashir, which I'm going to talk about, about his book uh, in a bit. Now, Claude Adas, who is a French scholar who published numerous works on Ibn Arabi and whose doctorate thesis at La Sorbonne was first published as Ibn Arabi or the quest for the red sulfur. And we've seen a beautiful uh, imagery from uh, Cecilia earlier, actually, taken from that. It, it discusses at length the significance of imagination in chapter eight of the Meccan openings. Claude Adas explains that this chapter is dedicated to the world of reality or the imaginal world and is part of the barzakh, the isthmus that joins all the orders of reality. It is the theater where the visions of the Gnostics are seen and where dreams take place. It's a spiritual world where contrary to what happens in this one, bodies have a subtle consistency and intelligibles take on form. To illustrate uh, this uh, experience of the Barzakh, um, I will move on to this slide. I'll make it a little bit smaller so you can see the whole writing. So as you can see, to illustrate this idea of the Barzakh as a world of imagination, I will be reading this exquisite passage from chapter eight. Uh, and as some of you are aware, um, uh, the Meccan openings have been recently uh, translated by Eric Winkle. And I will cl clarify further how Adas interprets this passage as well. And this is what the passage says. And I saw in this earth an ocean of dust flowing like water flows. And I saw stones, small and large, flowing one to another as iron flows toward the magnet. These stones are cleaved together and one of them cannot be separated from the other naturally unless a partition separates them. Thus, these stones are coalesced together one to another and based on them, a ship's form is configured. 
I saw there a small transport of twin holes. When they have consolidated the ship from these stones, they launch her onto the dust ocean and ride. They travel wherever they please to any country. Only the bottom of the ship is of sand or dust, adhering one to another with a special adhesive. Of all the things I saw, nothing is more wondrous than the coursing of these ships on that ocean. The area of transport at its turn between the two pillars is open, level with the ocean, but strangely, none of the ocean sand, Brahmi in Arabic, enters at all. Now, with regards to um, this mention uh, of uh, what is called the ship of stone as well in chapter eight, Adas notes that such a passage reminds the reader of surrealist paintings. She further explains that Ibn Arabi deliberately borrowed key terms from a specific lexicon in Arabic linguistics. For example, Bahar uh, is the word commonly used for the ocean, but it's also the word that in the language of Arabic poetry denotes the meter in a poem. Adas indicates that the use of vocabulary borrowed from the language of the Arabic poetry is obviously not coincidental. And from this point of view, the story of the stone vessels sailing over a sea of sand has nothing to do with the dream of a state of a delirious mind in that sense. So the vessel in Arabic, Sefina, represents the classical Arabic poem, which is Qasida. The inseparable stones are the words, Kalimat, in Arabic that when joined together form the verses which when arranged together make the poem. Thus with slightly encrypted language, Ibn Arabi points out to us that poetry is the privileged way to travel in the imaginal world of Bazakh, whose spiritual realities by their very nature are supraformal. And, and later we will have the uh, beautiful opportunity to listen to Nukhat's poetry that has allowed her in her own way as well to embark on such a ship of stones towards unknown realities. Um, so additionally to what I've just mentioned, um, Salman Bashir provides a detailed study of this concept of the Barzakh and its interconnection with imagination. And he compares it in his seminal work uh, to the concept of the limit uh, used in other scholars such as Al-Ghazali, Ibn Rushd, Plato, and Ibn Sina. It, um, Bashir indicates that imagination in Ibn Arabi's work is an intermediate reality, the reality of the limit, or what Ibn Arabi calls the barzakh. Barzakh is a term that represents an activity or an active entity that differentiates between two things paradoxically, through that very act of differentiation, provides for their unity. In the presence of the barzakh, meanings are embodied and uh, spiritual meanings are manifested in corporeal forms. And Bashir observes that the definition of Ibn Arabi provides here for the barzakh can only be tentative, which I totally agree with. And the bazakh is the very thing that makes the activity of defining possible. Understanding the definition of the bazakh is identical to understanding the essence of the activity of defining, which consists of differentiating between things. Ibn Arabi himself says that differentiation is the root of all things, but difference itself is a relation, indeed the most unifying of relations. Regarding this idea of unifying relations, the barzakh and imagination are somehow seemingly two different concepts. Yet Ibn Arabi brings them into contact, a little bit like the two seas that I showed you earlier in the image, and they meet. One is sweet and one is soft. Um, another significant contribution to the understanding of imagination in Ibn Arabi's teachings is made by Henri Corbin in his book, Alone with the Alone, Creative Imagination and the Sufism of Ibn Arabi, of its French title, L'Imagination Créatrice dans le Sufisme d'Ibn Arabi. Corbin brings to the fore the centrality of imagination, the work of Ibn Arabi, and explains that Ibn Arabi's first preoccupation is with the connections between visions on the one hand and the imaginative faculty and on the other divine inspiration. For indeed the entire metaphysical concept of the imagination is bound up 
with the intermediate world. So this experience of the Barza, or you can call it the world of imagination that Ibn Arabi describes in his works are intersected with such keywords as sight and insight, in Arabic known as Ain and Basira. In the relevance of retreat, a reflection on religious imagination, Rabia Terry Harris al-Jarahi indicates that Basira, the faculty of inner vision, is often referred to as the eye of the heart, and so it is. Ibn Arabi explains to us that the process of inner vision and the process of ordinary vision are the same, only their objects of perception differ. What does that mean? While ordinary vision uses the sensory vocabulary to look at bodies, extraordinary vision uses the imaginal vocabulary to look at meanings. So whether they're artists or scientists or poets or moralists, they have taken the eye itself seriously, trained it, challenged it, until it's able to engage vibrantly with the world that is there to be seen. Now, taking into account these words by Jarahi about how artists and poets have an eye that engages vibrantly with the world of imagination, I now propose to illustrate very briefly how the works of 20th and 21st century contemporary authors, such as Jabbar and Benjaloun, exemplify this imaginative experience of the Barzakh that Ibn Arabi described in the 13th century. So I will close the presentation here. Now, um, I'll start with, firstly, with um, Jabbar. Essie Jabbar, in her book, So Vast the Prison, or in French, Vast de la Prison, she introduces in the opening chapter a female narrator, Isma, who longs for her beloved. In this opening chapter, there is an intermediate world which brings together two opposite worlds, and this enables Isma uh, to see the unseen. This intermediate world reminds me of Ibn Arabi's Barzakh, especially in the way Isma describes it as a world that's neither real nor unreal. And she refers to it to a world where only the beloved existed. And she uses the beloved with a capital letter, which reminds me as well of the poem that Wafa and Cecilia have read, Daily Beloved. In the same way a spiritual seeker experiences with her eye of his heart or her heart, and reaches a union with the divine beloved, um, the realm of imagination. So Isma has more or less this similar experience that she describes uh, um, in the novel. In this world of the Barzakh, what would have been perceived as an impossible union between Isma and the, and the, and the beloved becomes possible. Here it is important to recall the significance of understanding this world of the Barzakh in terms of possibility rather than actuality. In order to gain access to this intermediate world, Isma's heart experiences visions, which recalls the way the heart of the Sufi seeker is emblematic of what Sayyid Hussein Nasr called the source of inner revelation. Also, according to Koba, the visionary capacity of the spiritual wayfarer is synonymous with the presence of the heart in the intermediate world, where immaterial beings take on their apparitional bodies and where material things are dematerialized to become subtle bodies, an intermediate world, which is the encounter of the spiritual and the physical. The heart of the seeker here, therefore receives visions of the immaterial realm through bodily appearance, while what belongs to the spiritual world manifests itself in bodily form. Likewise, Isma's visionary encounter takes place in her own heart. In fact, the first whole chapter revolves around this key expression of the heart, where she can see the beloved. The opening of her heart reveals a word that moves like an invisible being in her, in her own words. The visions within this world also enable Isma to experience an inner transformation and a revival that she describes as brisk and sharp. The beloved, who belongs to the spiritual world, appears in a sense perceptible and corporeal form to Isma's heart. Isma can see his face, she can feel his presence, she can even hear his voice. She can even hear the beloved speaking to her. He was talking to me and at the same time reliving. Imagine in the beloved, Isma enters a world that epitomizes a meeting point 
between the spiritual and the physical worlds that are separate yet conjoined, as though she were navigating her way through a dream while her own body was still lying on the couch. The female narrator enters a world that is neither hidden nor open, but it has the attributes of both. Such is Ibn Arabi's own definition of the Barzakh. This is what he says. Things are both real and not real. And in this paradoxical notion is to be found their very reality. Now to go back to es Esma, she experiences this entrance or navigation into this realm. There is some sort of a reality where her unseen beloved becomes seen and where she discovers the invisible treasures that she calls richesse invisible of another world, a richness of an intermediate world enshrined in an in-between, in an in-between. Her heart perceives the image of the beloved through an interior eye. And simultaneously, as she gains access to that world, she departs from the physical world that she inhabits and crosses its limits. Wasn't it rather me who found myself displaced in another reality? And this is what Asma, Isma was asking. In the sense, Isma experiences a different order of physical presence, which does not resemble her real life. In a very similar way, and moving on to Ben Jalun's novels, which are called The um, Sacred Night and The Sun Child, the texts present a world similar to the Barzakh, where opposites meet. It is a world that cannot be easily described, uh, a little bit like what Bashir is saying about the tentative definition of what the Barzakh means. And even in the, in the work of Ben Jalun, he talks about this something undefinable, quelque chose d'indéfinissable. It is in this world where the hidden secret of the protagonist, who is Ahmed slash Zahra, he has both names. So his secret lies in here. In that world, the hidden treasure and the unique secret that Ahmad Zahra emblematizes can be found. The protagonist is invisible, and his and her story is kept secret in a journal, which represents the secret book. However, the truth pertaining to the secret cannot be said, but lived. Has the journey of those hearing or reading the journal of Ahmed Zahra throughout this novel parallels the experience of the spiritual seeker who enters the secret realm of the Barzakh, which is none other but that of imagination. And this, this world cannot be described in words, but it can rather be experienced by those who embark on a journey guided by the journal of Ahmed Zahra. Like the intermediate world where the beloved in Vast de la Prison, so Vast the Prison can be secretly encountered, Benjaloun's novels pre present to the reader with a world that brings opposites into contact. On the one hand, so we have this world of darkness that Benjaloun talks about, and it comprises the secret that was kept hidden under a black stone. And in this world dwells pain, a memory filled with silences, everything that was not said, and the traces of truth. In the world of darkness, the truth remains invisible and veiled. The secret of Ahmed Zahra, the protagonist, has been veiled behind a lie and subsumed under oblivion. As her father confesses, interestingly enough, on the night that marked the descent of the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad. So on the other hand, there is this world of light in which the secret has been illuminated. In this world of light, Ahmed Zahra is transformed into Zahra, a flower which matches the beautiful flower that uh, Cecilia showed us earlier. And she experiences death in the mystical sense for her old self. And she is reborn as a child of light. Very briefly here, just I want to refer to this meaning of the death of the self or in Arabic, which is referred to in Sufism as fana. And Isitsu defines this as death, does not mean here death as a biological event. It means, um, I lost my line, I'm just trying to find it. So where is, is it? Just bear with me a moment as I scroll down. Yes, so death, death does not mean here death as a biological event. It means a spiritual event consistent in throwing off the shackles of the sense and reason. Stepping over the confines of the phenomenal and seeing through the web of phenomenal things to what lies behind, beyond. So this death that enables Zahra to gain spiritual illumination in a way also signals a movement towards her new rebirth. It is therefore clear that there are two opposed worlds that I was speaking about, 
that bring Zahra's journey throughout the narrative, consistent in bringing, again, two opposed realms, that of darkness and that of light. And the journey of Zahra is the catalyst for an experience of an intermediate world that ontologically parallels the Barzakh. It's a world that brings opposites together. Now, this recalls again Ibn Arabi's definition of the Barzakh as a realm that is neither existent nor non-existent, which I've mentioned earlier. Oscillating between the darkness and the light, the journey of Zahra is in constant transit. Therefore, there isn't a particular place that can be assigned uh, to Zahra's journey, nor can one definitely say whether she exists or does not exist. Zahra becomes here as a, as as a protagonist becomes herself both existent and non-existent, known at times and unknown at others. Within the intermediate realm of Benjamin's text, Zahra is emblematic of the Barzakh par excellence, as she stands for two separate yet conjoined lives. She encapsulates the journey of darkness and light, or maybe not darkness and or light, which epitomizes the secret of a conjunction that is beyond us all. And I'm using here the words of Benjamin himself. I'm coming now to the end of my presentation today. And to conclude, as you can see, I have attempted, like Bashir was saying, to give a brief overview of what it means, what the Barzakh concept means. And it's clear from Ibn Arabi's work that this reality resists all forms of definition and it continues to be a powerful source of inspiration, especially for authors like Benjaloun and Jabbar and like we've seen earlier with Cecilia, all these amazing artists that have been inspired by his work. Now, this world of the Bazaar or imagination remains, remains also like a puzzle for those who seek rational answers. I agree here with the words of Bashir who says, whenever a certain content of thought arises that seems to be incompatible with our rational mode, our first response is to find rational ways of dismissing it. We are puzzled less by the phenomena than by the way that they seem to continue to wriggle out of the categorical nets that we weave to contain them. So what I would say today at the end of this presentation is that whether the Barzakh is a barrier, an in-between, a limit, a boundary, or an intermediate realm, it sits at the heart of imagination. What can be found in this reality? I would say, I will use again the words of Ibn Arabi to, from his uh, work, uh, The Interpreter of Desires. He says, in this reality, you can find a word, a phrase, or a plaintive call to enchant the ear and bind the soul. Thank you all for listening, and I'll pass it on now to uh, David. Thank you so much, Green. And I'm now turning your attention to the round table with Barato Ayer, Antonella Leoni, Buket Cardam, Cecilia Twinch, and Rim Feriani. Antonella Leoni is an Italian artist living in Cairo. She holds a postgraduate diploma in Asian art and Islamic world and an Arabic calligraphy diploma. She also completed a master's in fine arts in Milan. Her artistic approach combines ancient techniques such as marbling and calligraphy with Islamic iconography and poems. The Italy Culture Mediterranean Project and the al Azhar Sharif Forum for Arabic Calligraphy are amongst her recent exhibitions. And she is currently working on an innovative program that focuses attention on how arts may be exploited as therapy. Professor Nuket Cardam is Professor Emerita at Middlebury Institute of International Studies in California. She has followed the Melami path of Sufism for many years. Her publications include both academic and nonfiction books and articles on gender studies, questions of identity, and human rights. Nuket has worked as an international gender consultant with various United Nations agencies. She has also undertaken needs assessment studies and evaluated women's human rights programs in Turkey, Turkmenistan, and Azerbaijan. More recently, she has been offering creative and writing poetry workshops inspired by Ibn Arabi. The round table will be chaired by Baratua Ayer a PhD student at the Humanities and Social Sciences Department in the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay. 
is interested in the Western continental and Islamic traditions of thought, publishing recently a comparative study of chapters from Ibn Arabi's Kursus al Hikam and Shankara's Crest Jewel of Wisdom. His doctoral work is on Heidegger's philosophy of history and the place of the Islamic philosophical tradition. Baratwaj. Thank you, David. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, I wish to open the panel with uh, two metaphors, uh, like keys with which to open a door, uh, from two modern contemporary authors related in their own ways uh, to Ibn Arabi. Elif Shafak, in one of her nonfiction works, writes about thresholds. She says that in her culture, thresholds are seen as, quote, elusive places, zones of ambiguity. The threshold stands for the interpenetration of the inside and the outside, like the spatial ambiguity of arcades or passageways in Walter Benjamin. Zones of ambiguity, a wonderful phrase, uh, but keep in mind though that it is not as if there is the exterior, uh, the threshold in the middle, and then the interior. As an elusive place, the threshold folds into itself the interior and the exterior. In fact, to use uh, film philosopher Tom Gunning's wonderful formulation, uh, this liminal space, the threshold, presents the exterior as the interior, the interior as the exterior. It is the threshold, this non-substantial thing that is hardly even a thing, that produces spaces. This is the first metaphor, a spatial metaphor. The second metaphor is a temporal one, to do with the breath and with speech. Abdul Wahab Medeb, in his book, uh, The Tomb of Ibn Arabi and White Traverses, places Ibn Arabi and Dante together and then separates them with a comma, meaning that the comma in this case functions both as that which joins uh, two things and separates them, Ibn Arabi, Dante. In the afterword to the book, uh, philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy uh, speculates on the role of the comma. The comma is the very condition of speech, of measure, of separation. A separation though, which at the same time is a union. Unlike the period or the full stop, which brings the sentence to an unambiguous halt, the comma is more elusive. Nancy says, and I quote him, uh, the period interrupts, the comma gives rhythm to the flow. But rhythm here, according to a manifest principle of scansion, of breath, foreign to the rhythm of syntax. Unquote. Connecting this to the question of uh, human relations and the comity and friendship of cultures, Nancy speaks of Ibn Arabi as, quote, wandering neither from the east nor from the west. Unquote. The Barzakh dissolves conceptual borders between cultures but not simply to assimilate the two into one, but rather to interpenetrate, to unite while at the same time keeping distinctions distinct and shining in their own inner beauty. With this, with these keys for opening, uh, with the threshold and the comma, I, op uh, I open the panel and um, invite our first panelist, Antonella, uh, to share with us her shining and beautiful creations I would like to thank Dr. Rim Feriani, the Mohaidin Ibn Arabi Society, Language Acts and World Making for inviting me at this round table. I'm indeed honored to present the unfolding of the Niger journey, a gift of imagination. El Burak, the king of imagination. What is real? and what is not real. Why when talking about tales, we use the word tale? It may be a tale, but not anymore if we see reality in it. And where does the reality come from? We talk with the imaginary world, like a real world when we see it real, when there is no veil. We consider it real because the spirit in it that is the divine perception. Considering the sublime importance of the transcendent aspect, more and more we may see as real by the gift of faith. 
Just as the herd becomes pregnant by water and produces an amazing vegetables, similarly the Ebro produces design that take the appearance of the cosmos through water and minerals. The natural looks that springs out from the gentle movement of the water produces the most beautiful effects, those that most resemble to the creation. So we take action with love and balance. And then we apply our imagination, intuition or perception and uh, with a sort of our awareness because we have to be able to letting go. Accepting imperfection is very important and um, no, be able to fail. Imperfection seen as a different perfection. Papyrus is a work of art. Like male and female, papyrus has opposites in its fibers, which run vertically and horizontally, helping each other to maintain the shape. Opposites are needed to understand and get gifted. The papyrus is strong because of its opposites. In that sense, it represents a symbol of searching perfection that lies in the awareness of the different qualities. The world lies in the close connection of opposites, which fight each other, but at the same time, they live only by the virtue of each other. Similarly, opposites are in the horizontal journey from Mecca to Jerusalem and the vertical ascension, a consolidation between vertical and horizontal, leading to Mohammedan perfection, according to Ibn Arabi in thought as well as the body of the Burak, as male and as female. This is also an example of opposites, a way leading to perfection. And this is my first image. What was the element that scattered my mystical journey? Intuition, imagination, perception, or what? The awareness that nothing in creation is, is unnecessary. We may see beauty in everything. Everything is there to be perceived and get connected. So in the previous image, we see from the abstract motif, a kind of horse. It is a horse which is about to fly. And that gives me the idea of the Burak. In other words, the Burak was there. I gave him life, like uh, taking out as a sculpture from a piece of stone. Thank you so much, uh, Anton Antonella, for that wonderful presentation and uh, for treating us with your wonderful creative work um, it uh, uh, the, the the image and the symbol of the burak is uh, so significant to your to your work as is also apparent from uh, the presentation so um, could i ask you to elaborate a little further on uh, the religious and cultural significance of the burak thank you very much for um, the Burak, although not mentioned in the Quran, is connected with the story of the Prophet Muhammad's miraculous journey to heaven. The name Burak is from the Arabic root Baraka, which means to shine or sparkle, and evokes lightning, the ability to travel at supernatural speed. The Burak first appeared in the 8th century in the earliest biography of the Prophet, as a winged white color beast, smaller than a mule and larger than a donkey. After a few centuries, it evolved as a female with a human face, adorned, adorned with a peacock tail, color wings, a gem encrusted crown, and luminous eyes. The Burak carried the prophet from Mecca to Jerusalem and through the seven heavens to God in the miraculous night journey. She is a devotional figure, closer to an angel than a beast. 
She was probably from the 19th century BC motif of winged horses by the Assyrians. Therefore, she is actually a version of the oldest and most widespread myths in our history. Many among us, I'm sure, have had dreams about flying. It means the desire of a floor to see and sense things from a wider perspective, to free our spirit, as well as to open borders, languages, and culture. Believing or not believing in this miracle story is not only a question of faith, but also of placing both spirit and body in the story. In other words, the awareness of being in one place by only spirit. This is the Bazaar, a meeting place of between the spiritual and material worlds, a place of inspiration. In this interworld, everything exists, real and imaginary, including miracles and spiritual ascents. Burak is a vehicle, the king of imagination, a speech has traveled. Thank you, Antonella. I was, speech as travel is a rather provocative and interesting, uh, interesting phrase that you, that you used. Um, um, it, uh, does art function as this um, traveling speech, according to you? Uh, can, does art and creativity um, function as that, as, uh, as speech as travel? We may consider the Burak as a vehicle a speech as a travel, and the travel as a speech. A travel as speech as a metaphor of traveling speech, as the Burak is carrying the prophet with his words. So we may see it firstly as a speech. A speech as travel, because by understanding his speech, we may have a spiritual elevation or awakening an ascension, and consequently see it as a travel. The duo, Burak and Prophet, in their night journey are crossing all borders, special borders on earth and in heaven, embracing the universal language of devotion, a dialogue with senses which enable us to create art that is, in mm -hmm. conclusion, a traveling speech as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Antonella, for that. Um, it is, of course, obvious that your work is so infused with beauty. And, um, and beauty is, in a sense, the work that, the, 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 the creative work that you, that you do. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, how does Ibn Arabi, um, take you towards beauty? How did, how did Ibn Arabi uh, take you to beauty? That, that, that's my question. Uh, according to my experience, the question actually should be the opposite. How does beauty move me to Ibn Arabi? Hmm. For me, art uh, is a travel mm -hmm. for human soul. It opens the borders and transfers spirit into matter and matter into spirit. A profound interaction occurs between the artist and the unseen world. It is a journey from beauty to beauty, where the mm. first is the beauty of God manifestation, and the second is the beauty of the artistic work realized. Mm. Beauty in its essence moves me to Ibn Arabic philosophy because imagination transformed in bodily forms becomes real. I see a shared path toward compassion, toward a manifestation of the invisible, a place where art, after all, becomes a fort of contemplation. It is a circular process where imagination, perception, our language is able to depict meanings and to create art. It is perpetual. 
It is a continuous traveling in multidimensional space. From images, we have new thoughts. And from new thoughts, we have new images. This is the divine dwelling in us. And we are open to receive it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Antonella. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for for the clarifications and uh, the answers. And um, with that, uh, we could now travel uh, to our next um, panelist, uh, Nukhet, uh, and um, I invite her to share with us her um, creative work, which is so inspired by, by Ibn Arabi. Nukhet, um, the stage is yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, I'd like to start with um, uh, Cecilia's beautiful comment that inspired me in, in her presentation that poetry makes me recognize myself. Mm -hmm. And I realize that that's exactly what's happening with my poetry, because mm -hmm. I've been an academic all my life. And only in the last couple of years, uh, it occurred to me to compose poetry. And mm -hmm. I think that has a great deal to do with the Sufi path I've been on for some time, but also with... Uh, the work with Ibn Arabi and the dialogue with Ibn Arabi that has brought this on, which is just, I find it just incredible. So I'd like to just share with you maybe several aspects of uh, Ibn Arabi that uh, has inspired me in my poetry. So uh, the, the first one is, um, as I understand Ibn Arabi's work, it comes from the world of the Barzakh. For, from the world that's the in-between world that everyone has spoken about, between the visible and the invisible. So when I, when I sit and compose a poem, I seem to be drawing from this world. So what comes to me doesn't come from my mind, from my thoughts. It comes from somewhere else. I can't say that I'm going to just sit and now compose a poem. No, it doesn't happen that way. My mind has to become empty with no expectations, no owning of anything. I would be sitting silently and meditating and what may flow is not flowing from my own restricted imagination, from my thoughts. By restricted imagination, I mean the third type of imagination. I think Cecilia talked about as well, which is like I may be imagining a sailboat uh, or sailing on the Mediterranean, you know, which I do often. That's imagination, but this process is qualitatively different. I'm both detached and yet fully present. So what has become clear to me is that this creativity doesn't belong to me. It's not mine. It's an attribute of the creator. And we each manifest our own creativity in our own unique ways. I believe that we have this perceptive faculty, all of us, that draws from this in-between world. So the first poem that I'd like to share with you is called The In-Between. The In-Between. There's a place of no place, a place where the two seas meet, they say. It's neither here nor there. It's the dividing line of the in-between, the visible and the invisible. Oh, what an enchanting place. The imaginal world, the world of visions, the world of creativity, where the one flows into the many and is received by each according to her receptivity, according to his receptivity. And where's that world, I wonder? Where is that world, I wonder? Until I realize that world is right here in each one of us. Or to put it differently, we are each the in-between. We are each the in-between. We are the material world and the spiritual world. 
standing at the threshold. And our work is to activate the heart. The heart where our contingent being meets the one. Let me move to the next aspect of Ibn Arabi's uh, writings that inspired me. And that's something that everyone else has talked about as well, which is the paradoxical nature of reality. So how come that the divine is right here, closer to us than our jugular vein, but yet way beyond us, transcendent and imminent? So we belong to both this world and yet we have souls that touch in a different world, into a different world. In our lives, we're sometimes happy, sometimes sad, sometimes we're constricted, sometimes we're expanded. So thanks to Ibn Arabi, I started to, to, to perceive a kind of playfulness in this process. It's pretty playful, actually, if you look at it that way. So the next poem that I have is called Hide and Seek. Let's play hide and seek, shall we? So, hide and seek. You are beyond me, yet you're here with me. How is that? You give life, yet you take it away. How is that? You're compassionate above all, yet you're fierce and foreboding. How is that? You're in my heart. Yet you turn my heart between your two fingers. My heart is sometimes wild, sometimes agitated, sometimes calm. Why is that? Am I asking too many questions? Probably, yes. Probably because this is a marvelous world where you play hide and seek with me. And I love it. <laughs> That's my latest edition. <laughs> so this is hide and seek. <gasps> and finally, there's two aspects that are together for me in the last poem I'd like to share with you of Ibn Arabi's writings that fascinated me. One of it is his circular nature of reality rather than linear nature of reality that he talks about constantly. And also that he's constantly playing with words. So, you know, the words have revealed different levels of meanings. So we just have to pay attention to what he's saying. Every time we read it, it's a different level of meaning that he has. So this poem came to me that's called Travel. Ready to travel? <laughs> travel. Travel. Traveling is happening every moment. The blood travels in the body. The breath travels in and out. But what is travel? Travel comes from travai, which means work. But what kind of work? The work to discover the answers we seek? Or perhaps to discover the questions we ask? Traveling is circular, sometimes to the center, sometimes back to the circumference of the circle. Now I'm traveling in a triangle within the circle. From living to dying and back to living. Then catching a glimpse of al Hai, the ever living, which supersedes living and dying. Oh, what wonder of wonders. The circle is becoming a sphere the triangle is turning into a pyramid with four triangles. And look, there's a cube inside the sphere. All 
building blocks of the universe. The building blocks of the universe? Traveling takes me outward, expanding, expanding forever. Then I turn and look inside. And lo and behold, it's all taking place right here, right now. But where's here? Here is inside the word where. Where? W-H-E-R-E. -E. Don't you see? The moment we ask where, the answer is here. Hidden inside the word where. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nukhet, for that for that poetry in performance. Uh, that was really wonderful and a, and, and a pleasure to, uh, to enjoy and uh, take in. Um, uh, in listening to you speak, I had two questions, which might actually be the same question. So mm -hmm. I, I'm going to ask both of them at once. I noticed that in your creative approach, Paradox is uh, significant, and this is quite manifest in the second poem, which is exclusively dealing with it. But it, it also flows through your, your, through the other mm -hmm. poems as well. So my question to you is how, and it's, it's also a question that I've, I've been dealing with, uh, uh, and and the question is how is, do you think that paradox, um, in itself, is important for artistic or central? to artistic production? That's the first question. The second, which, like I said, might be the same question is, uh, I, I noticed that, so the aspect of travel uh, sort of goes back to that, to that point that I was raising with Antonella about art as speech that travels. Mm -hmm. And um, you've spoken quite a bit about fluidity, so many things. So I was just uh, wondering uh, first about the paradox, and then and then the question of um, of travel. All of this relating to art. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, thank you, Bharatwaj. Um, you know, uh, the for creativity, the the most important paradox for me, it, it turns out that uh, it it has to do with the unique creativity that each one of us has, that we are all unique mm -hmm. and we're all able to manifest our creativity, all of us, and including uh, the, the leaves, the flowers, everything uh, is manifesting their own unique creativity. Uh, but yet at mm -hmm. the same time, this unique creativity, uh, I realized uh, I want to create because I want to be one with the divine. So that's the paradox. So uh, mm. I have a, a point, uh, a, a, some uh, uh, quotation from John O'Donoghue that I'd like to share for this, that I to have here. It says, our creative impulse comes from the dynamic interplay between our longing for the connection with the eternal, the infinite, for mm. integration, yet being fundamentally fragmentary and unique. So how is it that we are all, you know, so unique uh, and want to manifest our creativity, but at the same time, that's the desire to be to to reach the divine uh, at the same time, you know? I mean, uh, for me, it was like, oh, I'm appreciating the multiplicity of this world so much more when I realize that everyone is creative in their own right. That it's like this prism, you know, where the light shows up in multiple gorgeous colors. You know, so mm -hmm. everyone has creativity, which is a very different world way of looking at life and people and other living beings than I used to. So that's that's a big change for me to see the world from this eye. You know, so I I really want to stress that uh, this whole thing we are discussing is not abstract. It's something that one takes in and lives and makes it a living thing. 
Hmm. All of what Ibn Arabi says can be lived, I hmm. believe. Hmm. Yes, and also I think the uh, the the tension that is produced by the opposites, hmm. I mean, and the spark of that tension, as it were, uh, mm. touches on the question of creativity and and maybe also the travel, uh, which <laughs> uh, the mm. traveling across uh, boundaries, traveling across yeah. um, contours, uh, uh, boundaries really, mm. and how how the uh, how how in a way the paradox provides us with these two not exactly irreconcilable but uh, two opposite sides which which in a way need each other and yeah. in a way it sort of goes back to uh, some of the things that we've been discussing through the through the in a way stitches together all the notions that we've been discussing through the through the panel right about how a distinction uh, is necessary and but, but at the same time union but not yeah. by submerging the distinction Things like that. You know, I, yeah. sorry, I interrupted you, Bharat. No, right. no, definitely. No, no problem. Right. So, uh, I mean, this is such a beautiful, important question because uh, it, it, normally we get stuck in one or the other of the opposites and refuse mm. to see the other side in this world. But mm. what Ibn Arabi is telling us is that opposites are not opposites, that in fact opposites are uh, a dynamic in uh, polarities and there's it's a dynamic interplay between them is is right. how the world uh, ma you know manifests itself if we could just see it and I remember a quote from someone else that said that creativity resides in the relationship the interplay the tension mm -hmm. of these opposites so mm. for example how could we have music if there was no silence between the notes Yes, How could yes. we have art if we didn't have, uh, you know, empty space? Isn't that exactly. true? Yeah. So we need silence to approach, uh, to appreciate music. We need emptiness to bring out the form. So there is always this opposite, this tensions between the known and unknown, activity, receptivity, discipline and chaos, habit yes. and risk taking. It's, uh, it's what I love is that it's like an infinity, infinity sign for me. Mm. that goes back back and forth yeah. and these polarities are constantly going back and forth sometimes at balance sometimes not uh which reminds me again if you translate it to life that every moment is a moment of unforeseen novelty mm. we could say that mm. every moment is we're breathing mm. in and out and the life is being recreated. The life we're experiencing is new. Hmm. What a beautiful way to conceive of being alive. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And I also think that your poem, uh, 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 when you talk about the play of the opposites, and uh, it, it does remind me of just, I mean, it, it brings up all these things that you're saying about how um, it's never ending creativity and never ending life. So um, yeah, so so thank you. That that was that was really wonderful, and um, thank you. Yes, yeah. As, as I said uh, in my presentation, okay. uh, the world uh, lies in the close connection of opposites, which yeah. fights each other, but at the same time they live only by the virtue of each other. Yes. Yes, that's the yes, that's the key. Yes, yes, and in a sense, that's also um, our major uh, uh, point of uh, uh, our central point in this roundtable. I mean, ultimately, that's what uh, we, are, we are we are talking about. Gentle now, doves. Poem eleven from the Tarjuman al Ashwak by Ibn Arabi. English translation by Michael Zells from Bewildered, Love Poems, from Translation of Desires, read by Nuket Kardam, followed by a new unpublished Spanish translation of the same poem by Pablo Benito, read by David Toroyo. Gentle Now Doves Gentle Now Doves of the Thornberry and Moringa Thicket don't add to my heartache your sighs. 
gentle now, lest your sad cooing reveal the love I hide, the sorrow I hide away. I echo back in the evening and in the morning, echo the longing of a lovesick lover, the mourning of the lost. In the grove of Gada, spirits howled in the branches, bending them over me as I passed away. They brought yearning, breaking of the heart, and ever new twists of pain to try me. Who is there for me in Jam and Pebble Ground near Mina at Tamarsk and the way station of Naaman? Hour by hour they circle my heart in rapture, in love ache, and touch my corners with a kiss. As the prophet of prophets circled the Kaaba, which proof of reason called unworthy, and kissed the stones there, he reasons very voice. And what is the abode in measure to the human being? How often they swore they'd never change, compiling vows. She who dyes herself red with henna is faithless. A white blazed gazelle is an amazing sight. Red dye signaling, eyelids hinting. A pasture between breastbone and innards, marvel. A garden among the flames. My heart can take on any form. For gazelles, a meadow, a cloister for monks. For the idols, sacred ground, Kaaba for the circling pilgrim, the tablets of the Torah, the scrolls of the Quran. I profess the religion of love wherever its caravan turns along the way. That is my religion, my faith. Like Bashir and Hind, love mad Kais and his lost Layla, Maya and her lover, Gailan. Hay palomas en los árboles de Arak y de bamposadas. Tened piedad. No dobléis con zureos de nostalgia las ramas de mi pesar. Tened piedad. No mostréis con lamentos y con llanto el escondido secreto de mis pasiones y anhelos. Al crepúsculo y al alba, cuando con ella converso, como el eco le respondo con anhelante suspiro prendido por el deseo, con el trémulo gemido de un amante arrebatado. Los unos contra los otros, espíritus como llamas, rugen en los tamariscos del boscaje, cuyas ramas envolviéndome tendía hasta que me devoró. Hasta mí, de tan intenso deseo y pasión ardiente, trayéndome novedades de las pruebas del amor, vienen con diversas formas. ¿A quién tendré junto a mí, en la morada de Yama, el paraje de la unión, y en el Mohassab de Mina, lugar del desasimiento, ya en destino deseado? ¿A quién tendré junto a mí, en Dat al Asl, el origen o el bendito Naamán? Una y otra vez dan vueltas en torno a mi corazón, entre el tormento y el éxtasis, besando mis cuatro esquinas, así como el enviado, el mejor de todos ellos, circunambuló la cava, sobre la cual la razón no alcanza a dar argumento. Él mismo, de inspiración y palabra tan dotado, piedras en ella besaba. ¿Cuál es, pues, su condición? ¿Cuál es el valor del templo? respecto al grado del hombre. ¿Cuántas, cuántas veces ella se comprometió jurando que no habría de cambiar? Mas no es lo propio de aquella que se pinta con aceites el cumplir con las promesas. ¡Qué asombroso es el prodigio de una gacela velada, que señala un azufaifo y hace señas con sus ojos, y cuyos pastos se encuentran entre costillas y entrañas! ¡Qué maravilla un jardín en medio de tantos fuegos! Capaz de acoger cualquiera de entre las diversas formas, mi corazón se ha tornado. Es prado para gacelas y convento para el monje. Para los ídolos, templo, caaba del que en torno gira. Es las tablas de la Torá, 
y es el libro del Corán. La religión del amor sigo a donde se dirijan sus monturas, que el amor es mi práctica y mi fe. Tenemos claro modelo en Bishar, prendado de Hind, y en ejemplos semejantes de quienes igual amaron, Laila y Kaif, Maya y Gailani.